Good day, everyone. Particularly to those who are battling children at home uh, and dealing with uh, the COVID restrictions. This talk is about uncrewed aerial vehicles and the avenues that they provide to enabling us to collect a level of data or achieve a level of sensing that is not currently available in the earth science community. And it's not just about the platforms, but it's also about the data and how you steward that in order to achieve something uh, quite unique and special. You uncrewed aerial vehicles or drones, as they're more commonly known, have been around now in the public consciousness for at least a decade. They've obviously been around a lot longer than that, but as a, as a tool and as a toy, uh, they have been something that we've been immersed, with, immersed in and aware of for coming up to 10 years. And they provide some really unique capabilities. This infographic on the left is just comparing uh, uncrewed aerial vehicles with the sort of survey dimensions that satellites can, can cover versus what you can do on the ground. And UAVs in terms of survey dimensions can obviously collect data from over the same dimensions that you would do if you were mapping in the field uh, up to the sorts of dimensions that satellite platforms are covering in the tens of kilometers and, and more with some of the more expensive UAV units. The unique thing about them, of course, is their ability to collect ultra high resolution data. So this means that they can achieve um, a level of data that uh, facilitates us bridging the scale gap between outcrop or plot scale data and satellite data. UAVs are also able to actually deploy sensors in the field. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. Uh, in future slides. Something else to point out is their ability to act as an intermediary between ground, air and satellite. So they are the perfect platform for enabling us to do clever things with upscaling and downscaling of data. And a great example of that is hyperspectral data. But perhaps less realised is their ability to collect data that is useful for calibrating or providing baseline corrections to larger scale remote sensing techniques. And a, and a good a good example of that would be collecting high resolution topography data, which can then be used as a baseline to correct an uh, INSAR uh, for, for a, a range of applications. Very quickly, there's a large number of types of platforms out there. Um, multi-rotors like helicopters, fixed wings like aeroplanes. But the one I really want to focus on, which really is beginning to open up avenues for achieving something quite unique, are the VTOLs, the vertical takeoff and lift platforms. These combine the, the flexibility and power lift of the multi-rotors with the long flight duration of the fixed wings. Um, <clears throat> The beauty of UAVs and drones, of course, is that they enable us to, to access uh, areas of ground that you cannot normally reach. They're portable. We can do repeat surveys, so that means you can begin to do um, the uh, studies that allow for change detection. They tend to be um, affordable from the $1,000 range up to the $100,000 range. And above all, they remove the human element from the air. And so there's an enormous safety uh, gain with the use of, of UAVs. And in terms of the kind of sensing uh, data that they can collect, they are able to do everything uh, from the uh, collecting information across the electromagnetic spectrum to uh, deploying geophysical sensors. And in particular, most recently, almost becoming standard now is, is AirMag and um, GPI. It's still early days, but it, you can find commercial outfits deploying um, these geophysical sensors. And I'm in discussions with a number of people around the country now in terms of how we might apply uh, and employ UAVs to collect MT or form of magnetotelluric data or EM, potentially even gravity. Other than that, they are they are ideal instruments for um, 
for hyperspectral, multispectral, thermal infrared sensing, LIDAR, photogrammetry and aerial photography, and they've even been used to collect um, forms of uh, radiometrics. And the flexibility of the instruments is really opening up um, enormous opportunities, and it's quite easy to envisage national scale hardware infrastructure, um, which we would then link to the software infrastructure. And in this infographic, I'm just showing, illustrating some ideas that uh, are very achievable with the technology we have at hand. So you can imagine swarms of drones deployed from a mobile, um, a mobile base, which might be collecting um, various forms of data, including magnetics, for example. And the beauty of, of UAVs, of course, is that you can interact with them while they're in flight so that you can be potentially, as they're detecting a, a feature of interest in the subsurface, they could modify their line spacing, just as an illustration. Um, for the collection of things like um, geomagnetic depth sounding, which is a form of magnetotellurics, um, or gravity, then the more likely way of deploying the instrument will be to grass in grasshopper mode, where a, a UAV may f land into the landscape, drop a sensor, take off, uh, survey the ground around for topographic effects and drop a second sensor uh, further away. Or the, or the UAV may be integrated with the sensor in some, some way, land, um, power down, collect the information, power up and then move on to the next site. I just wanted to illustrate some examples of the data that is being collected and the quality of it um, globally which really shows and illustrates to us what we can achieve here in Australia. I already mentioned MAG, and here's just some experiments to show you the quality of what can be achieved. This data set on the left was collected from the ground. The data set on the right was collected by UAV. And you can see there's very little um, significant difference between the two. The ground MAG was upward continued to 15 metres above ground, and the UAV MAG was collected at 15 metres level. A very recent publication by Flores et al, has really opened up um, the, the opportunities that are available through hyperspectral sensing. And the sensors in hyperspectral sensors are now advancing at pace. We have soil and mineral classification that's been achievable from hyperspectral sensors for a while, but we can now use um, hyperspectral sensors to actually collect information directly from water. And in here, uh, using ground truthing and training of, uh, of the of water samples, they were able to calibrate it with hyperspectral sensing and map out river chemistry in a site uh, in Europe. And in this case, they're mapping pH, iron concentration and redox. Some very quick examples from my own work, um, thanks to students like Greg Daring and Sam Thiel, high resolution photogrammetry, um, the, these are four outcrops we surveyed uh, using a commercial off-the-shelf off the drone, but the, the real advance was in the software engineering at the back and how you analyze this enormous amount of data. So greater than 60, 60 dikes at three to five millimeter per pixel, more than 20,000 aperture measurements of those dikes. Suddenly we're making observations on these features that were never possible with conventional field techniques. And you can see this fine scale oscillation that is appearing in the aperture. That sort of oscillation has never been observed before. And so it's beginning to give us insights into Earth processes that are truly unique. A second example of photogrammetry and what's possible comes from uh, another student of mine, Sam Thiel, who has really has advanced what we can do with these data sets. Uh, developing semi-automatic methods for mapping geological boundaries, extruding them into 3D, 3D measuring um, thicknesses and orientations with uncertainty properties attached. And you can see again, he was able to uh, do a few surveys, collect over 30, 38,000 square meters at one centimeter pixel, representing over a million points of data. And this all leads finally to the sorts of national infrastructure initiatives that, that are ongoing now and are worth informing you about. The Australia Scalable Drone Cloud um, is being led by Monash University, but supported by Oscope, 
TURN and the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility in CSIRO. It's a national scale cloud based um, initiative to put together the sorts of tools and processing algorithms in, um, in the cloud uh, and make them freely available to the user community. And this is an infographic of the architecture that is being built within Australia's scalable drone cloud, where you can see uh, down at the bottom uh, the data sources, uh, fast transfer tools from a drone in the field to offline processing that can go be fed through into storage and then ultimately into the cloud ecosystem environment where you might have your processing engines, in this case, structure from motion for photogrammetry, combined with analytics engines uh, and various libraries in order to serve up your 3D models and your analysis of those models um, uh, into the cloud environment, make them available and discoverable and queryable and publishable. So the future is really exciting with this technology and what it could bring to the earth science community. If you want to know more about it, feel free to contact me on my email. The Australia Scalable Drone Cloud, we are looking actively for user cases. So if you have data out there that you would like to um, provide to that initiative, we are uh, would be very interested in hearing from you. Thanks very much.